All right. Good evening, everybody. How are you? Good, thanks. Good. good. It's a really good turnout. We're never quite sure how many people to expect for something like this. And uh, I think we guessed it all right. So this is pretty good. Um, thank you for being here. I want to share something that my colleague Jan Harder always says. Jan is the counselor for uh, Barhaven. And she says, the difference between people in the suburbs and people who live downtown is two to three hours. And that's the amount of time people spend commuting to work. And those two or three hours, you know, beginning of the day, the end of the day, it adds up. And those are hours that make it challenging to come out to community meetings like this one. And I know a lot of you probably juggled uh, family commitments and, uh, uh, you know, maybe left work a little early, maybe rushed for dinner to get here. So I appreciate taking your time tonight. It was really important to come out to meetings like this and that you uh, get involved, and get engaged, and share your ideas. Um, I want to introduce some people here tonight. You'll be hearing from many of them this evening. Um, first of all, the, uh, the team from Huntington. So Alan Witten is here. Where's Alan? Alan's by the door. Uh, Lisa Westfall, right next to Alan. With Craig Witten. Where did Craig? Craig's at the back of the room. Uh, from FOTEN. So FOTEN is a planning consultant working with Huntington. And we have Brian Casagrande and Emily Coyle. Uh, Ryan Poolwine from Project One Studio. Ryan's the architect that's working with Huntington on this project. Uh, we have a couple of people from the city's planning department. We have Stream Shen, my left here. Uh, Stream is the lead planner on this file. So any of you have sent a, a formal email to the city, it's Stream who receives those and who you will get a response from. And also from the planning department, Mark Young. Where's Mark? There's Mark. Uh, Mark's in the planning department. I invited Mark tonight because uh, Mark is also instrumental in drafting and finalizing the Stittsville Main Street Community Design Plan. Uh, so there may be some questions that come up about that. And who better to uh, answer than uh, the person who uh, really wrote himself? I bet you recognize some of the faces in this room because I, I know many of you were involved in the uh, public input to create that community design plan a few years ago. Uh, we have a video camera set up. Uh, we're not webcasting live, but we are recording it. So there's a lot of interest from the community. And so we're going to be posting a video of this presentation part and the Q&A uh, to my website uh, later on this week once we get that all encoded and uploaded. I also want to, I know I saw John Curry here from the Community Voice. Is there any other media who are here tonight with us? Just point you oh, Stittsville Central. How can I forget? Yeah. Leslie and Russ, thanks for coming. Um, yeah, tonight, I think we're all here tonight because we, we care in some way about the future of Stittsville Main Street. And I think if we all kind of closed our eyes and thought of a vision for the street, you probably all are thinking of some vibrant shops and services and restaurants. And you're probably thinking about a really uh, walkable street. Uh, but you, you know, you probably have the basis, the basis of that kind of image in your head. Uh, this has been a really interesting project. Uh, uh, the feedback we've gotten so far has been uh, all over the place. Some people really like what they see. Some people really don't like what they see. But I just wanted to keep in mind that I think I think there's common ground that we're all looking for what's best for the street, and I think there are some, some things that we all have in common when we think about what is best, what is good for Stittsville Main Street. Um, it's going to take a lot to get us to that vision. We're, we're certainly just starting that journey right now. Uh, it's going to take residents coming out and participating in events like this. It's going to take investment and developers who, who share and align to that vision. Uh, it's going to take uh, the right businesses too, the right mix of local businesses and entrepreneurs who, when there are uh, new buildings or older buildings that get renovated, the right people to fit into there and, and build that streetscape of people. Um, and it's also going to take uh, not just buildings that we're talking here tonight, but also uh, programming, events, activities to bring people out to the street and uh, other beautification as well. You know, hanging plants, uh, new street lights, new benches. There's a lot that we need to do to get the ball rolling. So a new building like this is one part of that potentially, but there's a lot more that goes into building a healthy street. And of course, we have to solve the traffic problem as well. Um, we're not going to be able to solve all of this tonight, but I think we're going to touch on a lot of these as we go here. Um, now tonight, what we're really looking at is Huntington Properties have submitted uh, a zoning bylaw amendment and a site plan control application for 1531 Stittsville Main Street. Uh, we have had a community design plan in place here since 2015. And uh, I met with Huntington previously, and I told them they're, they're pretty great because they're the first ones to propose a four-story building. The zoning allows for four-story, but Huntington is the first developer to actually put forward a proposal that would go up to that four-story limit. And 
And so I think they're brave, but I think they also have a lot of responsibility to get this right. I think it's going to set uh, some precedent in the community. And I think if it's done right, it, it can be a very healthy thing for the neighborhood. Um, I also want to point out, too, I think many of you are probably coming out because you're concerned about the 1531 Stittsville Main Street building, so right on Stittsville Main. There is also a seven unit condo or townhouse development behind it. And I know we have some people from the uh, Beach Private Condo Board, or condo residents who are here as well. So I know they'll have some questions too, and, and uh, we'll hear about your concerns as well. Um, we will get into details tonight from uh, Alan Witt and his team from Huntington about what they have in mind. We'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. We have about 90 minutes. We will not get through every question, but I hope we can get through as many as we can. And uh, I'll be moving around the room. Uh, we've handed out some cards on the table. I um, hope I got this right. The blue cards are for questions, right? So you're welcome to put up your hand, and I'll come over with the microphone and ask you a question. But I know some people are not necessarily comfortable asking a question in front of a large group. So my team uh, will be around to collect any cards, and we'll try to get as many of the questions up as the cards as well. So I'll point out my team. Way at the back is Emily from my team. And along the side is Chelsea and Bethany over by the door. So you can flag down uh, any of those three with a question or a, a blue question card. And uh, let's see. I think that's about it. My, my job here as counselor tonight and, and beyond tonight is I really want to see the best possible developments for Stittsville Main Street uh, within the framework that we have. We have uh, zoning bylaws, we have the community design plan, we have provincial policy, we have the official plan, uh, and it's anything that I do as a counselor is making sure that we have the best possible solution for the community and where we identify issues that we can uh, resolve those to the best of our ability. So really looking forward to hearing your questions and concerns tonight. And with that, I'll hand it over to Alan Witt. Very much, Glenn. Well, I'm, uh, I guess I'm a bit intimidated a bit uh, because uh, a couple of people have now said, Well, you're very brave for putting yourself out in front of the group. It's normally consultants. But uh, uh, I, I thought it would be good to give you some context uh, about uh, who's doing this and uh, what we've done in the past and, and why we're doing this. Um, uh, we, uh, I, I guess, talking about the Suburban had in the West End for over 30 years, and so I guess I'm a suburbanite, although I've recently moved closer into uh, West Ottawa. But um, you know, I feel like I'm connected to the West End. I, I've done a lot of community work. I've, uh, I've been a hockey coach and um, on the boards of the Community Resource Centre and the Chamber of Commerce and the Queensway Carlton Hospital Foundation. So. I feel like I'm somewhat connected to the community. And then uh, since the uh, late, mid-90s, we've been, uh, our commercial real estate business has been buying properties and developing properties in the West End. Um, we, uh, uh, we, in 1998, we invested in a property on Ivor Road. And now we have about five properties on Ivor Road. So we're um, quite active in Stittsville. We bought, uh, sorry, we, uh, just on that, we, uh, you'll soon see some development on uh, Hazel Dean between Iver and Frenchwood. Uh, Huntington is developing a retail plaza there. Uh, there's a new No Frill store, which is part of the Wabla's chain going up, and uh, other retail. So we're we're excited about that, and we think it's going to be a great addition to uh, uh, the West End in Stittsville. Uh, we acquired this Stittsville Main Street site in 2002. Um, it's kind of around the time when Janet Stavinga was the mayor and she was beautifying Stittsville Main Street. And she had a, bit, a vision for Stittsville Main Street to, to, to uh, encourage walkability, encourage shopping. And, uh, she, I think either her or Anton Wittenberg, the previous mayor, arranged to, to acquire the land and create the parking lot uh, across the street from our site. And um, I've always thought that. You know, it's not going to be like Merrickville or Richmond Road, but it's um, Stittsville Main Street has always had a lot of potential in, in uh, managing and renovating our, our properties on Stittsville Main Street. We think we've, you know, we've, um, we've been responsible owners and we've kept them up and we've had tenants and 
I think, contributed to the, uh, the neighborhood. But the properties are really beyond, um, you know, uh, reinvesting and saving. They're, they're very old. They're, they're really falling apart. And, and you know, they, they would take a lot of money just to keep them up. But at the same time, uh, the, 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 the Stittsville economy, the Canada economy, and the real estate market is very strong. Yet there's a, a lack of multifamily and um, apartment type of uh, property. So we, we think that it's a great opportunity for us. We think that our, our site will, uh, will add a lot to Stittsville. Um, I was, um, as a sort of a landowner, um, I think, and Mark maybe can answer some questions about the CDP, but I, I was part of the consultation uh, for the CDP and had some feedback and, and saw that go through the, um, the process and, and I, think it's a, I think it's a good one and we've tried very hard to, uh, to be um, uh, compliant with it and um, um, see, you know, see what it, uh, it, it uh, asks for. So um, I just wanted to give you some context about who this is, who we are and, um, and where we come from. So uh, next uh, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to talk about Planning. So, thank you. Thank you, Alan. Good evening, everybody. I'm uh, very pleased to be here this evening. Uh, Emily Boyle, who's uh, assisting me with the planning on this file, is firing up the overhead. So, uh, there it goes. That was quick. That's good. Don't have to on. Um, so, I won't actually, I'll be as brief as I can be so we can get to Ryan and get to the question and answers. Um, but there's some fundamental things that we as planners look at when we're um, advising clients and assisting with applications of this nature. So, I'll briefly go through that with you. Uh, keep going. Oh, actually, can we kill the first lights, Lisa? Okay, so everybody I think here knows it's a big property, but if you don't, uh, it's, it's uh, labeled around there in, in orange, the corner of Spitzville and Orville Street. Um, next slide. It's a little bit closer up. You can see it in context of the existing buildings that are on the street. You can see it in the context of the townhouse development that was built to the rear. Next slide. Uh, there's. Um, as planners, um, many of you would know this, but in case you don't, there's layers to plan. Uh, basically, at the city's highest level, you have their official plan, which is an overarching policy document. And then you have more area-specific plans, like the Stittsville Main Street CDP and secondary plan that was referred to, which I'll get into a moment, in a minute. And then below that, you have the zoning bylaw. And they all have to sort of fit together in the sense that you know, one can't be out of conformity with the layer above it and so on. So at a very high level, this property is actually designated um, a traditional Main Street at the front. Um, and in fact, that designation carries all the way through to the full depth of the property. And then beyond that, you get into the yellow that's shown there, which is a general urban area. So general urban areas are generally areas that are residential. They're generally low-rise development at their highest. Uh, whereas traditional main streets are areas where you typically see a little bit more height and density depending on the area and you certainly are looking at a lot of things such as mixed use development. So this is basically telling you what I was just referring to but I won't read it all but um, you know, it's, uh, moving through there quickly, um, the, the, the official plan in the, in the traditional main street on its own if this didn't have a secondary plan, would actually advocate for four to six stories of height. Uh, and then you get into the type of um, policies like section 411 in the official plan, which really looks for issues of compatibility with its context. Um, and the other key thing that we look at with all developments on, on arterial roads is whether there's a, a right of way to be protected because development oftentimes has a property line that's you know, here, and the official plan is envisioning the street widening, so then the city will require you to be here. And in that case, you have to actually dedicate some land to the city as part of your development, and this development is actually going to have to do that to a small extent. Moving on. 
So moving to the Smithville Main Street Secondary Planning Community Design Plan. They're basically one and the same as to speak simplistically, but the secondary plan takes the key elements that influence development out of the community design plan and makes them policies and nests them into the official plan. And in doing so, it gives them teeth, as we say, within our, our the development and planning community, which means that things have to comply with that plan. If they don't, your only alternative is to amend the plan, and that's never an easy exercise. So in embarking on this project and advising on this project, um, although we contemplated because of the depth of the site, whether it might make sense to look at a development that is actually higher than what's proposed. At the end of the day, it was quite clear to us in discussions with the staff and the counselor um, that that was going to be, uh, in many ways, a non-starter. So we, we really focused in on, okay, so what, what makes sense within that existing policy framework? And uh, next slide. These are some of the key things on two slides that really come out of that policy framework. The Statistical Main Street Secondary Plan is uh, to implement that CDP uh, and is providing a framework for chain. Statistical Main Street features more of a, more of a dispersed village-like built form, primarily residential type buildings, uh, some of which have been converted to a variety of commercial uses. So that's the existing condition, if you will. And the Secondary Plan and CDP identify four distinct districts along that corridor. Um, and they all have different policies and visions, but the one that we're dealing with here is called the Village Center Precinct. Next slide. In that precinct, it's to be characterized by the remnant heritage buildings, many of which have been converted to commercial. And it's also been identified as a target site for mixed-use development. More specifically, that precinct includes policy directions for the development in the area that supports this. And this site is in the traditional Main Street designation along with low-rise residential des designation that applies to the rear of the site. And basically, one of the key policies stemming from that is it's limited to four stories. Uh, finally, the secondary plan notes uh, that new buildings shall have a built form that encloses and defines the street edge. So there's a lot more policies of that nature in the secondary plan, but really what it's driving at and what the actual official plan drives at is trying to frame in this street, trying to create a built edge that feels a lot more comfortable for the pedestrian and promotes mixed use and um, animated environment. Next slide. So moving to the zoning bylaw, this is a very interesting site for us relative to the zoning bylaw because you have the traditional Main Street zone at the, at the front, it's called a TM9. Every zone in the city of Ottawa has different sub-zones that differentiate on their performance standards. Performance standards are things like setbacks. And then it has an exception and a height limit of 15 meters. The exception um, basically stipulates that both the TM zone and the R4Z zone that's at the rear are to be developed as one lot for zoning purposes. And so you can see that that R4Z zone goes all the way back and includes the townhouse development to the rear. So, although this isn't what's proposed here, if one were to simply imagine that all the buildings on both those zones were gone, it could be developed in a way that ignores any of the zoning lines in between it. So you would basically be taking zoning performance standards from the front zone and the back zone and applying them as if, for example, what's in the rear, their front yard would basically be along Stittsville Main Street. So, it's hard to explain from a planning perspective, and I can certainly do this in breakout sessions for people later, but the result of this, or, uh, so these are the performance standards we look at. I won't go into all of these, but moving forward again, Emily, keep going. So this is the site plan that we're gonna get into in a moment to explain to you, and Ryan's gonna do most of that explaining, but basically what you see at the bottom is the building that's up on Stittsville Main Street, and the building at the rear, which are townhouse development, um, and then there's a, a driveway in between the developments. So you have basically two buildings that have a very distinct nature. The one at the front is a mixed-use building. The one at the rear is just residential townhouses. Next slide. Now, this is what we created to help people understand what, that, what we call as-of-right zoning reality is for this site. 
So while the development is shown, and you won't be able to see it well underneath until Ryan gets to the, the, the pure slide, um, it's showing you there the built form that's proposed. But the pink is actually showing you the built form that they can be built without touching the zoning at all. So simply pulling a site plan application with the City of Ottawa, um, although they would certainly work hard to influence something that doesn't look so massive and, and you know, globular, their as of right is that. And so when we look at the site from the perspective of, of planning and plan function, we think that um, at the end of the day, Huntington is taking a very reasonable approach to how they're developing the site in the face of this. Um, but it's complicated and I'll be happy to explain that later. Moving forward, Emily. This is basically what the proposal is, because of all that complication, is to simply simplify the zoning and take a TM9 zone all the way from front to back on this property. And, and when you do that, you really, most of these performance standards naturally line up with the development that's proposed. There's only two small areas where it doesn't. The first is the corner side yard setback, which I'll explain in a moment. And the other is the location of a small garbage enclosure that I'll, I'll explain in a moment as well. Go ahead, Emily. Uh, keep going. So here's the site plan again. And so the setback that we're having to um, modify is actually a requirement along the uh, Orville um, side road um, that requires the building to actually be closer, not where it's proposed. And where it's proposed is to give a certain amount of relief along the street where a patio or something could be built. Um, and it's also to, to accommodate a ramp that's needed to get uh, handicapped accessibility into the building on that side. So although we can actually cantilever the building out above it and meet the zoning requirement, the idea is that it doesn't really make sense to do so. The other zoning relief, as I mentioned, is the garbage enclosure, and that's in the top right corner of the building. You can see these sort of two wing doors, if you look close enough. That actually has to be moved over to the left, something like a meter. And we could have put a parking space on the other side of that enclosure and moved the parking enclosure over, and you know, we could still contemplate that if necessary, but again, it would seem to be an unnecessary adjustment. So, for the most part, the zoning, although we're changing it to a TM zone, we're really staying right in the wheelhouse of what the TM zone is supposed to be, is what the, the message really is. Um, so, that concludes my presentation. I think I'll be around um, and available on the mic later for questions, but I'm going to turn it over to Ryan to really show you what I hope you'll get excited about relative to the architecture. Hello, everybody. Um, so, my name is Ryan Cohen. Um, I'm the principal of Project One Studio. Um, we're fortunate to be the architects for this project. Um, I should say before we get too far into this that as a practice, we really believe deeply in the power that design can have on enhancing urban environments and on enhancing everyone's daily life, daily existence. We believe strongly um, that architect architecture really creates the framework, the background in which we live our lives, and that background can have a very powerful impact um, in current day and also in, in how you know, small blocks, big blocks uh, evolve in the future. So in considering this site, um, it's such a wonderful site because we have, frankly, frankly, an underutilized corner at the moment, and then we have this void condition at the back, all of which is just begging for some kind of engaging architectural response. So um, I'll start by talking about the townhouse block towards the rear, and then we'll shift our focus on um, the building along Spitzville Main Street. Now, part of our activity here for the townhouse block was really looking at this missing piece. So we really see this as an act of, of completing uh, the courtyard, of completing two halves that was waiting for a third, really. So this is really an effort of, kind of completing the circle and really um, adding a tailored piece that's going to help to complete that block to really make that courtyard something that it was always meant to be. Um, and, and we've designed the townhouses as though the front of them is really facing that courtyard side. So you can see that while there, there may be driveways towards the lower portion, so the tennis block is towards the top, there may be driveways towards the lower portion, 
The intent is that, is that the residents will use more often these porches toward the top, and those porches feed directly onto this courtyard. So it's, it, the entire block has been designed to, to have direct engagement with that courtyard to help animate it and to help you know, really make it what it was always meant to be. Now, part of the challenge of developing the site as well is that we have Stittsville, Maine as a, certainly a facade that needs to be um, designed to a high level of detail, to a high level of resolution. We wrap around the corner to Orville, which again requires a lot of attention. And then we get to the townhouse block and towards the outside portion that faces the courtyard. So all of that you know, needs to be designed in a way that's mindful of the pedestrian realm of interaction. Um, and then the way we approach the, the basically the, the inner workings, the stuff that needs to happen to make a project functional, is to look at this gap between the two buildings, serve with a single drive aisle so that we're not using more hard surface than we need to. And we're able to service not only the driveway of the townhouses, but we're also able to service the parking requirement for the mixed use building um, and uh, also the garbage store. So basically, all the back of house requirements are literally going to be tucked in a single alleyway um, behind, these two, behind these two buildings. Now, I say alleyway, of course, we're showing trees. This is going to be a very nice good landscapes uh, portion. But the point is that we're being very efficient with you know, kind of the less desirable areas of the building so that we can certainly highlight uh, the more desirable areas of the building itself. Now, moving forward, so moving down the page towards our treatment for, for the building itself, you can see that, that because of the setback from the road widening lens that we've been forced to provide, we actually went back about another meter and a half, and the reason we did that was twofold. One, we believe that, that the at grade level of commercial needs to be served with some animation, and we wanted to have that meter to allow us some room for articulation, so to provide canopies, to provide you know, details, the great, the at grade level um, ornamentation that really helps to relate to the human scale um, and helps to kind of complete the sense of, of uh, individualization and, and really working at the realm of, uh, of pedestrians to make it feel comfortable. You can also see that this is allowing for quite generous areas here in front of all the retail units for um, patios, for spill out space. So we really see this as being a really active and engaging part of the building. In front of this, what we've also provided uh, in the road widening, this is something that we're, that we're proposing, you can see is actual parallel parking spaces here. If we're going to consider this a traditional Main Street, we should be providing things that traditional Main Streets feature, and one of those elements is parallel parking. We like the idea that, you know, as a street calming, or sorry, as a traffic calming exercise, you know, if we're, if we're trying to go with this notion of a traditional Main Street, yet you being able to parallel park in front of the shop that might be in there, grab what you're going for, and then pull out. It's really powerful in fighting, you know, uh, the economy of, of you know, suburban big box stores, where every store has a parking spot in a parking lot that's in front of, you know, a separated environment. So this allows great interaction with the, with the pedestrian realm and with the streetscape itself. So the next slide. So this, we're, you know, we'll go into the building here. So we'll just kind of explain the way the building itself actually functions. So we have underground parking. Um, this underground parking space serves nearly all of the residents. This is where we also house uh, mechanical spaces for building, um, bicycle parking. So we're exceeding the bike parking requirement for the building. Um, and this is an effort to be mindful of, frankly, the cycling culture that's, that we understand is booming in Stittsville. Um, we know there's a lot of connectivity with some of the, some of the bike paths that are nearby. So we certainly want to enhance active lifestyles with the residents in the building. We could go up one more. So this is the ground floor for the building. So we can see at the very top that tongue that sticks out is the parking ramp that brings us down to the underground. Um, we have four commercial spaces on the lower portion of the floor plan. And then just past that, you can see the double door that opens out. So that's the residential entrance. So that's the main entrance. It, it comes off of Orville. Um, walk into a very generous lobby. And then you'd be working down towards an elevator. Or we have uh, four suites that are at grade level. So um, we service the building so that the residential units start at the level grade. And if we go to the next slide, we can see a typical floor that has an extra level at the top, but a typical floor that's basically separated um, with, a varied, uh, with a variation of unit sizes. So we have some, very, um, some fairly generous two bedroom units that, that hit the corners, and then it scales down to more modest uh, one bedroom units towards the center of the floor plate. So, you know, again, this is adaptable to. Um, different demographics to downsizers or perhaps to people that are, you know, uh, young professionals that are just starting up, but either way, there's, there's a variation of unit sizes to meet 
uh, the requirements of, of different demographics and different living styles. So getting to the architecture of the exterior of the building, um, you know, we, again, we, we really focused on the importance of this site and the potential for this site. So we certainly saw the ground plane as being something that was meant to be glass, as something that was meant to feel like a retail environment and to really promote this idea of um, shops of, of a really active and engaging pedestrian realm at the ground floor. And we, as we move above, we have two levels of, uh, of residential above before the building steps back at the fourth floor to, to have an upper level. So these, these decisions were very mindful. So we're, we're looking at, at kind of a strip across the bottom that's a little bit higher floor to floor, a little bit more grand, a little bit more typical of a commercial environment. And then the two levels above really work to kind of counterbalance that strip of retail that we have on the ground floor. And these volumes here that we've got, you can see that we've divided them into three volumes. And the reason we've done that is, is, is a further division. So not only are we dividing the building horizontally, but we're also dividing it vertically. And the reason for that is we actually do have quite a bit of frontage here along Stittsville Main Street. So it's important to us to, to try to subdivide that. So the building reads more as three masses that are stitched together, as opposed to one monolithic structure that might be overbearing, that might overwhelm the neighborhood. Um, so what we've got here are these three volumes two brick volumes that more or less bookend the floor plate that are you know, using a, a red tone brick, which is very typical for the area. And then we've got this middle volume here that's using a stone-like cladding. The stone-like cladding allows us to have much different articulation. It allows us to play with the overall articulation of the building as well. So the tone and the, the, the feel of this first block is going to be significantly different than what you experience with the second block, which will be different again with what you experience in the third block. And these three volumes the, these three articulations that we see here are reinforced by this canopy detail that we see at the very top of the building that drops down in each one of these volumes here to reinforce that this really is to be interpreted as, as a segmented building of, of basically of three volumes that move down the street. Now if we go to the next slide, here we can see the building more of a, a head-on view so we can see how we've articulated this into three separate components here. And again, we're playing with, with or it's playing, we're using a, a very mindful of the fact that we're using very natural materials in this building. Building materials that are timeless um, and that relate well um, to the human experience. So we've got you know, these two bricks here as we talk about in stone. And at the very top here, what we're doing as well is we're, we're using cedar. So this is going to be a real wood treatment that we've got on the top of the building. Again, speaking to natural materials, which was an element that we found that repeated uh, time and again with the, with the guidelines for the CDP. Now, if we flip to the next slide. Now, we really like this view because it, it certainly does a great job of showing this uh, blend of materials that we've got and how different the center volume here feels from the brick on the other end. So where we've got these kind of stone-like piers, it's a series of frames that kind of stick out. So you certainly get this, this feeling of verticality of columns, whereas with the brick here, it certainly breaks down into much more horizontal bands. And then not showing up all that well, but there's a series of, of canopies that project out as well, almost creating an arcade, and again, trying to make this, this pedestrian round feel as comfortable as possible and as walkable as possible. And if we go to the next slide. So this slide really kind of showcases this corner experience. So this is right at the corner of Orville and Statesville, Maine. We can just see how expressive and how engaging this patio space can be. You can see that we've got signage above ample blazing, you can see the treatment of some trim and some detailing right here. So not only do we have brick kind of over here, but we've also got these painted wood elements right here and here. And once we go around the corner, these actually extend from the face of the building. So you know, ornamental treatment that we're using in a way to be engaging, as we're using in a way to create detail, um, to help break things down to human scale. And then with the deep relief that we've got with all these recessed balconies, it certainly fights this impression that the building is flat. You know, we create deep release to really emphasize the push and pull that's going on with the building with these articulations. Now, I'm sure something that's going to be coming up with the questions is going to be talking about elements of heritage um, and traditional elements with the design of the building. And certainly this is something that we considered at great length when we were designing the project. Um, it's important to us that the projects that we design are, are responsive to context, so it's responsive to not on the buildings around us, um, 
but are responsive to kind of the future vision for the area. And in this, in this report, or in this way, you know, we're certainly getting a snapshot of a pre-development condition. This building is going to appear massive compared to what's there right now because this is the first one to get done. So it's hard, it's hard to get a sense that this building has a sense of scale with the current streetscape because it doesn't. But what we're imagining is that in the future there's going to be more of this type of development and in the next 10 years this is going to be closer and closer to the norm in terms of building size. Now in terms of the architecture itself, we understand what's been written in the CDP. We understand this desire to represent the heritage of the Stisco Main Street um, area. At the same time, just about every heritage document that you'll read will talk about the fact that you need to respect existing heritage, but that buildings need to be of their time. We believe this building is of its time. We believe that this building speaks to a lot of the details and a lot of the guidelines and a lot of the parameters that we put forward in the CDP. While we might not be seeing traditional details exactly in this building, the decisions that have been made have been made to make the building more functional. Um, the goal here is to make a building that's genuine with the time. And what we try to fight against is what we would call a false narrative or a pseudo historicism, where we're creating a building that looks like it was from 80 years ago. These buildings always fall flat because they're disingenuous. What we're trying to provide here is a building that's genuine to the area, that's responsive to the context, and that will serve its residents very well for the years to come. Okay, thank you, Ryan. So that's the, the formal presentation. The rest of this evening, we have about an hour. Uh, we're going to keep it to questions and answers and try to get as many questions and as many answers as we can tonight. Does anyone have a question to start things off? I should add, I should add too, if you, if you would like, you can write a question on the blue cards and my team will be around. Um, we also have coffee and cookies, so don't be afraid to get up if you need to stretch your legs. Okay, question. Um, you discussed at great length building at the front. What about the townhomes? I haven't seen anything about the townhomes. So we do have two, sorry, my apologies. We do have two renderings of the townhouses back there. So the townhouses, to just speak quickly, I don't know if it's appropriate to get over the works. Okay. So the idea with the townhouses, and something I didn't mention, was that we certainly see these as transitionary buildings between the existing condominiums that are built and the new building that we're proposing. So we're taking cues as much as we can from the existing townhouse. So what we're doing is we're matching the roof line for what's currently there. So we've got a gable style roof that we find in the, in the original block. Um, and we have similar height, although these buildings will, will sit slightly lower than the other block that's perpendicular to the street. But what these townhouses do is they serve as a transition from the existing uh, condominium block to, to the new building here. Um, so what we've done is, is, as I mentioned, used a similar massing, but the materials that we're using to clad this building are in keeping with the material palette for the new building. So we're seeing um, brick in the same tone, we're seeing some, uh, some stone-like treatment, and then we're also seeing some um, uh, pre-engineered uh, wood siding, which doesn't appear in this building just for code reasons, but um, again, it's, it's a material palette that's all very much in keeping with what we're seeing with the, with the mixed-use building. And uh, again, it's, it's going to be a very smooth transition uh, from the condo block of this building. I guess I'm curious, if the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, those buildings are in between are never going to really ever be in the sun. They're always going to be shaded by the other two buildings. Is there any consideration to, it, it might be very dark. I'm sure that's true. So you're, you're, are, you, are, you, are you referring to the existing two well, buildings? We've got those two buildings that are, you've got the existing townhomes, you've got a four-story building, and these are going to sit just a little lower. The sun rises kitty corner, so they're not going to see a lot of light with those two tall buildings standing there. I don't know that the spacing is that tight that it would obstruct daylight getting into those units. Because as I'm seeing it here, this is oriented, so north is this way. If we're talking about the two existing town or condominium blocks, they should have no impact on the amount of daylight that's going into this newly proposed townhouse block. 
And there's enough spacing in the courtyard itself, I would argue, that wouldn't affect the original condominium block in any capacity. Sorry, if I can also add that um, the, the, uh, the townhouse block is, is sits on the uh, the footprint of what was previously approved for stacked townhouses, but it's simply lower than what was previously approved. Okay, we're going to be running a lot around a lot tonight because you can't hear if you're not on the mic. So. It's a good exercise program. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Glenn. Um, no question, the property needs to be redeveloped. Or I understand you, there's no point in investing, I don't think, any money in the existing buildings that are there. And this is a picky little point I acknowledge, but you're setting the tone for all the rest of the redevelopment on Main Street, quite right, because it is all going to get redeveloped. Can we not do something about a flat roof line on that building? So, the flat roof is a tricky thing, right? Because multi-unit residential buildings have two things that need, be, that need to be looked after. So the first thing that need to be looked after, and that we haven't really touched on too much, is they all have uh, amenity space upstairs. So that's that's part of the amenity space that we're providing to the building. So where we have amenity space requirements, we kind of necessitates the requirement for a flat roof. So we can have patios and we can have spaces for residents to enjoy themselves. The other thing that multi-unit residential buildings all have is, is a is a mechanical requirement. So, you know, real estate in all these buildings is quite expensive. So the place that we put our boilers, our air con or sorry, our, our, our chillers and generators and all that stuff is gonna be on the roof as well. Getting that to work on a pitch roof environment creates a number of limitations in We're terms of- even if you had like that sort of half gable at least at the street side that you've got to kind of so, that one flat so, the, so, I mean, I was going over the technical components. I would say to, to, to close out the answer, the other impact is going to be the overall impact of the roof itself and in, in terms of the mass of the building itself. Because we need to we need to achieve this height regardless, just to be able to get the four floors of residential suites in there. If we then go and add a pitch roof on top of it, the overall impact of the building, the height, the sense of height of the building is going to be greatly increased because of the roof itself. In general, most flat roof buildings have a much lower impact, a much lower burden on the street itself because the top of roof line is so much lower than if we had a pitched roof. So I saw a few hands up, but I do want to ask a few that we have on the cards. Um, not sure who's best to answer this, but the question is, uh, will the sidewalk on Main Street be 1.8 meters? Or I suppose, what width will the sidewalk be? Who's, who's best to answer that? Would it be Brian or Ryan? Um, Brian, you can yell at me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Uh, I don't believe that we're aware of what the city's plans are within the road widening allowance. Um, the sidewalks currently, I believe, are, are designed up wider than 1.8 meters wide, and we would like them to be as generous as possible for the, for the interim until we understand what the city's plans are for the development of the street. And then the other sidewalk question we got was, uh, uh, while construction is happening on Main Street, what will the availability be of the sidewalk? people continue to be able to use the sidewalk on Main Street while it's under construction? Um, so that's a, it's really a question of construction staging. Um, I would imagine that the strategy would be in place to make sure that the side that was always a passable sidewalk. So certainly there's going to be construction fencing, there's going to be um, restricted access, likely at the property line while construction's happening, and we wouldn't touch the other side. And then there'd probably be a, con uh, a transitory condition where when we're doing these three edge modifications, we'll open up the sidewalk on the property itself while we do those modifications so there's always a pass to the sidewalk. Right. And that reminds me of a question I had. Do these get built simultaneously or is it phase one, phase two? Phase one, phase two. So phase one is the right on six yeah. lane, phase two would be new line. Yeah. And is it how far apart are they? So we have to wait until the first one is done before the back one is built or is there some overlap? or? There may be some overlap. Sorry. There may be some overlap, but certainly, um, from a construction perspective, and not wanting to get in anybody's way, um, it's likely that the area for the townhouse block would be the construction staging area during the first round of construction. And um, depending on timelines, there might be a condition of overlap, or there, or it might be that, that the townhouse block is built at the conclusion of construction. When would construction start? Yeah. Um, 
it would be best to answer that because uh, there's two parts to that. There would be the, the planning process going forward, and then you know the actual timeline. So, Alan, come around here. There's no uh, definitive answer, but uh, uh, the project is uh, scheduled to be heard at the planning committee in, in May, uh, and assuming that that was uh, approved soon after by city council, um, the planner and the manager, Mark Young and Stephen Chenner here, and, and uh, there's been no major uh, planning or uh, infrastructure or technical issues brought to our attention yet, but um, you know, we, we're, we're hoping that, that that agenda stays. And if that's the case, um, we think that it's, it's possible. There's a lot of, a lot of additional design uh, and technical design and, and uh, work to be done. Uh, we think it's possible that we could start construction later in the year or, or perhaps as an alternative uh, in the spring around the year. So, we're hopeful this year, but uh, we can't be sure about uh, the planning process. And uh, right now, the real estate market is very, very strong, and um, it's um, it's tough to find contractors. You know, we're, we're engaged. We, have, we know a lot of them. Uh, we're engaged with that in that process, but um, it's uh, finding trades, finding trades people. Um, very difficult, it's challenging, but um, work still gets done, so we're, we're hopeful that it, uh, it could commence uh, later this year, but uh, we can't be absolutely sure, so I hope that's uh, a sufficient answer. I saw a hand up over here. Yes. Come to you, sir, in the blue shirt. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Uh, I represent uh, the Port Station Condominium and Mongol Board of Directions, just so that you know who I'm speaking. Uh, I had a quick conversation with Mr. Chen over there and regarding the setbacks. And I noticed you mentioned the one about the side yards and also one regarding the, the garbage bin, but not the one regarding the 10 to the 0 meter setback. Now, he informed me that it wasn't really required by Huntington Properties uh, because it was already covered in the original site plan. However, we've had legal opinions which disagree with that completely stating that if you are in, in fact rezoned, a midnight private is rezoned to become a mixed use, that the original uh, zero meter setback is in, no longer valid and then it reverts back to the 10 meter setback. So that's an issue that needs to be clarified. Uh, another thing that concerns us is that um, what happens to the site, the original site plan, if the zoning is granted that means the original site plan is no longer in effect. So moving forward, I guess we'd have to meet with the city planners to determine the intricacies of all that and its implications. Yeah, we'll, we'll try to get an answer tonight, but I know that uh, I know that Stream Shen the planner is uh, is available to meet directly with the uh, the owners of the condo as well. And uh, Stream or maybe Brian, in terms of setbacks and and previous site plans, to, can either of you uh, address that one? Uh, so relating to the setback issue, um, right now, all three lots, um, when you saw it on the board, the one uh, closest to this domain where it'll host the mixed use, the middle lot that hosts the uh, future townhomes, and the back lots are uh, what we call one lot for zoning purpose. So between these lots, there's actually, um, there's no setback requirement between them. So as of today, uh, if somewhere were to come in and build something according to the zoning bylaw, there's no need for setback between the middle lot and the orbital station lot. Um, so uh, they're really not changing that condition. I know what you were referring to with your the legal opinion, as I spoke to the lawyer on, the, on your side. Um, in the beginning, when uh, the application was originally submitted, it indicated a rear yard setback change from 10 to 0 meter. And the reason for that was uh, the TM9 had a rear setback provision. But uh, when I spoke to uh, the planners on the other side and discussed a little bit farther, uh, we did come to the conclusion that because of the uh, exception that being the one, uh, 
for zoning purpose, really it wasn't required. Uh, so I hope that answered the setback question. Relating to the existing site plan, uh, just because you change the zoning doesn't mean the original site plan that's registered is null and void. So whatever site plan applies on there will still apply until a new site plan comes in and uh, if hunting can choose to withdraw the portion that's not on the condo land, you know, um, they can do that, but for the portion on the condo land, there's some uh, you know, legal implications because now you're the owner, so we don't have a right to really pull that part of the site plan away. So whatever is approved on the condo land still has standing, and I believe Huntington will work with you to, to ensure there's some uh, you know, finishing touches on the, on the project. Thank you. Good, good. A couple other questions. Did you or? Uh, yes, actually, I do have one more. It's uh, regarding the uh, stormwater facility. Uh, right now, as it presently exists, there is one which is on our property, and apparently it comes under the auspices of the city water management program. Um, previous conversations with the former council, Chad Cadley, he said it is actually part of the city's uh, overall water catchment uh, city plan, but it's because of our property we're actually responsible for it, so we found that rather confusing. And the second part is when the townhouse, the townhouse that was originally planned, there was supposed to be a second stormwater facility, which would hook up underground to the existing one. So we're wondering what happens with that. And if it doesn't happen, then it become, it, the first one becomes a conduit. And then from a safety point of view, we've got a big hole there. And we worry about issues, buildings and such a condominium, liability, etc. So any, any comments regarding that? So at stormwater management, Brian, your screen probably. Okay. Um, so we do have a uh, engineer on the file that's reviewing all the stormwater, sanitary, and water matter associated with the site, uh, and we're definitely going to make sure everything works uh, you know, before we provide the site plan approval for this project. Um, but just uh, like I haven't uh, delved into detail on the technical matter, and I, I think we should definitely take this offline. I'm happy to set up a meeting with our engineer. But generally, with a phase condo development, the phase, first phase has to be able to stand alone by itself for us to approve the condominium uh, registration portion. But I think we should talk offline with our engineer. Okay, thank you. Just in the, um, in the context of what I was saying earlier about Stitchville Main Street, you know, we're looking forward to animating the street, which is a term that's used. Um, we've been consulting on the project for, for quite some time. We had a, a mandatory consultation with the city back in uh, mid last year. And um, uh, recently, Councillor Gower, uh, we went back and we, we did speak to uh, previous councillor, Shad Codry. He had, he had a lot of feedback. Uh, we have uh, that meeting included um, Tanya from the, the, the Village Association, and we're scheduled to meet with them again. Um, and Councillor Gower also. Um, to um, talk to the um, neighbors, some of the neighboring, neighboring businesses, which you know, we're pretty excited about. You know, it's, it's not a lot, but we all know about the success of Quitters. Uh, there's a new rest, new, newish restaurant, Jack Catch, adjacent to the city parking lot. And we're really looking forward to really energizing this part, the village precinct of Stittsville. Uh, we also, you know, we like the traffic lay-by with the parallel parking, as I mentioned. We think that's that's not our parking, it's, it's everybody's parking. But uh, we also want to encourage uh, the city to um, uh, talk about a um, pedestrian crossing somewhere along Stitzel Main Street. Uh, again, Councillor Gower has talked about the, uh, the, the, uh, the new, um, I don't know if I, the, the term is escaping me, but the the cycling parkette. Uh, the trailhead. The trailhead, yeah. yes. Which again, is, is, I think it's going to be, you know, we know there's so much traffic on the Trans Canada Trail for cycling. Uh, the, the, um, the people at um, uh, Quitters talk about how, how many people come to, um, to their, to patronize their uh, restaurant for uh, cyclists. And uh, we, think, we think we can build on that. So just people around the neighborhood from uh, Abbott south to past our property. There's, there's, there's so much potential, and we think that by 
opening it up to for pedestrian, for traffic stopping um, cyclists, that uh, it can really be uh, an exciting part of the city. So, I, you know, Councillor Gower did uh, bring together some business people, and they had some great ideas. And uh, as we develop our plans for retail and the ground floor, which is a big part of it, I think it's going to be an exciting uh, uh, little district. So, I just thinking of a few of the things, the comments and discussion, I thought I'd just add that. You, you mentioned the pedestrian crosswalk, uh, which is a good segue into this question from someone. Uh, I'll paraphrase it because it's a, a concern we've heard a lot so far uh, through our office, and it's about uh, traffic. Uh, it's already a, a busy intersection at Stittsville Main and Orville Station. Uh, even uh, intersections further south, like at Bray Street are difficult to turn in and turn out of. Uh, obviously, anytime you add more businesses or new homes, you'll be increasing the uh, traffic load on the street. So um, how, how does the planning process address that, and what can be done to make sure the impact of additional traffic is mitigated? Probably Brian or Street. Maybe, maybe straight from the planning process to start. Um, so as part of our uh, planning process for both the zoning and the site plan, um, there's a public component and there's a more technical component. So within the city, we do a very broad circulation. So we have on hand um, specialists in terms of engineering infrastructure, um, parking, uh, park plan, uh, real estate, and all sorts of different fields. So this has been circulated to the transportation group, which will um, look at issues like uh, to look at the sidewalk width to make sure it's compliant with city standards, um, to make sure the intersection functions well, uh, what are the AM and PM peak traffic flow onto the street. Um, so the, um, the developer's consultant has submitted what we call a transportation impact assessment that details how many cars are projected to come in and out and how many pedestrian and cyclists are projected to come in and out of the building. Uh, the, the AM peak hour and the PM peak hour. Um, so we'll definitely be looking at that. The city has a very quantitative standard in terms of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable for intersections. Um, it's uh, according to how much delay you're experiencing. So our technical expert will make sure um, those standards are adhered to. Uh, and um, so you can find a copy of this transportation impact assessment online, um, or I can send it to you if you want to send me a quick. Traffic impact assessment is assessed, and the engineers say the road can't handle the traffic, and that stopped the development here. I think that's uh, more an issue. It has to be looked at a site by site basis. Just because of different contexts, I know, uh, for example, not in Stisco, but in the more urban area, there's um, different standards, and in the suburban, there's different standards. Um, so we really have to look at a site by site what's the impact and what kind of threshold are we talking about. So I'd like to have an opportunity to work with our transportation specialist first to determine uh, what impact this has. I did take a look at it before the meeting, and um, because of the number of units, there's a limited number of cars going to be coming in and out of um, the Orville and Stittsville intersection. In the AM peak hour, most of the cars, what they're doing is they're turning right, going northbound on Stittsville Main. Um, so generally, that's, that's an easier way out turning right than uh, doing a left. Um, so in the PM peak, obviously, more people coming back. So I want to have the opportunity to talk to our technical experts um, before uh, you know, I can really help with that question. If I can just add, in my experience, um, the answer to your question is yes. But it's rare. And what, the reason it's rare is because before we even get to a point of submitting, the transportation consultant is working with our team would say to us, whoa, we have a problem. And then we would have to try and work to get it to a point where that consultant, in their experience with the city, is prepared to advocate on behalf of the development. And sometimes it triggers mechanisms like lane introductions or signal timing adjustments. It's a whole series of, of you know, levers, I guess you can, that can be, can be played with to try and improve the situation to the point where it's acceptable. So to my knowledge, in this case, there was no concern from our consultant, which usually means, aside from some refinements, 
they're on the same page with the cities, but we'll wait to hear on that. Okay, question over there. I don't know. You need to. Yes. So what 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 gets gets counted or how they how are they evaluated? What's the scope of the traffic impact assessment? So I wouldn't say I'm the best person on that because I don't want to pretend I'm a traffic expert. But uh, my understanding is amount of delay in terms of seconds. But uh, again, you know, I want to refer back to our transportation specialist, and I think I can get in touch with our uh, with yourself and uh, look at that. For us. What about how big of an area? Like, does it just look at Spitzville, Maine, and Orville, or does it go as far south as Bray Street, or does it go as far north as, you know, the entrance into Wildwood or something? How how big of a how big of a uh, zone of impact are you looking at with the traffic studies? Uh, typically, with traffic study, there's a screening and scoping exercise in the beginning, so it really depends on uh, the size of the development. Again, I have to bring out a traffic specialist on board to, uh, I don't want to give out any misinterpretation or any information. Uh, so if you give me your contact information, I'll definitely find the information. Okay. Uh, let's go to this table. Okay, it's a 21st century question. Um, have you considered whether to get any sort of lead certification? Have you considered putting a green roof on? Have you considered solar panels? Have you considered electrical connections at the parking spaces? All of these things have become more important as global weather change becomes a stronger reality. The building's going to be here for 30, 40, 50 years. What is going to be done to help the future? Right. So it's, it's a great question. So grab, grab the mic, Brian. Oh, I need a mic. Yeah. Thanks. So these are great questions, um, and of course it always becomes a bit of a challenge, but the nice thing that we see with a lot of these buildings, especially when they're rental buildings, is that the owner stays the operator for the building long term. So a typical condo building, you can imagine, developer builds the building, they're selling it, they're getting rid of the asset, so their upfront costs matter a lot to them, and how the building performs down the road is less important. It's a really nice shift from our perspective because we absolutely care about energy efficiency with our projects. So now it becomes something that the owners are looking for as well because the maintenance of the building is, is a huge item as far as they're concerned as well. So before I talk about electricity, you know, PV cells, that kind of stuff, talking about building durable building materials are critical. Talking about insulation, all of our projects exceed the minimum insulation levels required by code. And I should mention that every two years, give or take, the insulation and energy efficiency requirements of the Ontario Building Code increase. They become more restrictive. So a building built two years ago could get away with less insulation than a building being built today. The, the part of the challenge that we've had when we're looking at some of these um, traditional guidelines, let's say, where you know people are looking for things like double-hung windows, double-hung windows are very poor performers in terms of energy efficiency. The windows that we're showing here not only provide substantially more glazing, but the glazing units themselves are higher R value we do high performance glazing modules with argon gas fill and they have protective films on the inside so they're, they're managing and mitigating UV rays as they come into the building. They're top performing window systems. Now, on the subject of PV cells, this is certainly something that can be explored. PV cells are still at a point right now where it's, it's an onerous upfront cost in terms of revenue generation at this point. In the future, who knows? And this is actually one of the advantages of having a flat roof is that it's the most efficient roof to be able to put a solar array on because you have you know, complete flexibility in terms of your solar configuration or arrangement to be able to get the, the greatest yield out of, that, out of those cells. The green roof would also mitigate some of the issues. Yes. So the, the green roof is, is something that we're seeing in almost all of our projects these days. And so they go from being very ambitious, extensive green roofs to even something as simple as having a seat embed that's put on top of the roofing membrane that doesn't uh, incorporate any undue loading to the structure itself provides a green roof, reduces heat island effect, basically reduces all those, those thermal conditions that you're talking about. In terms of underground parking, 
I believe right now that, that we're certainly investigating putting in um, electric charging stations, and by 2020, it's going to become a requirement of the building code. So all these elements are, are certainly something we're considering with the building. Okay. Uh, the topic of construction, a few more blue card questions. Um, I'll do a whole bunch at once because I can probably be answered by the same person. Uh, will the noise bylaw be obeyed during construction? Uh, is any blasting required for the underground parking lot? And uh, will there be any effect to wells of nearby homeowners as a result of the underground parking construction? <coughs> Do you want to take that, Alan? Uh, certainly, um, we'll comply with, uh, I mean, our, our constructor will certainly have to comply with <coughs> all bylaws. I think you're talking about the um, 7 a.m. curfew, I think, is, is uh, but it's, I think the city has some very um, extensive regulations on how, how construction has to happen. So um, yeah, in terms of blasting, we don't know. Uh, although we, we have a soils uh, test, and uh, we don't, I, I wouldn't think so, but I, I can't stand here and say no for sure. But uh, uh, our soils <coughs> examination testing did not un uncover anything unusual, but um, I can't say for sure that that will not happen. Um, you know, wells, I'm not sure, I'm not aware of, again, we have a, a civil engineer that has reviewed uh, the site and hasn't, um, hasn't identified anything, but um, certainly we wouldn't be allowed <coughs> to, dis to disturb anyone else as well or, or um, any other condition property, but um, I have to admit that I'm not qualified to give those answers, but um, you know, we have um, very experienced, uh, our uh, civil engineering company is uh, DSEL, David Schaefer Engineering, they do extensive work in Stittsville in the neighborhood, and um, very familiar with the conditions, um, and uh, you know, we'll be hiring a professional contractor to build the, uh, the building. So, um, again, Probably an incomplete answer, but the best thing to do right now. Okay. Yes. You know, one, one of the one of the problems with one of the headaches with this sort of new development uh, always seems to be parking. Uh, whether it's meet, meeting the bylaws or, or getting it right, getting the right number of spots. Um, having looked at the having having looked at the site plan. Now, I don't see it on, on these particular documents, but the, the calculation for parking spaces for this whole development, uh, for, the, for the residential units in the multi-use uh, is, is fine, and visitor parking is fine. And of course, the townhouses are no problem because they've got their own, they've got their own garage. But uh, the, the commercial units on, on the ground floor of Main Street. Now, um, I see in the plan, and it's been, it's been addressed uh, briefly and safely, uh, you, you now have uh, seven on-street parking sites, uh, which is nice and convenient, but the, the developer can't claim those as, as part of your ration, so to speak, uh, that you're allowed by the city. So, um, have you got some further plans for, you're going to be about half a dozen spots short, I guess, uh, if, if the, calculations, the calculations are correct. Uh, so, uh, as I said, you're going to be short parking spaces uh, under, the, under the zoning bylaw. And the, the other uh, thing also, I don't want to be too technical here, but uh, the calculations that you had uh, for the required parking spaces for the commercial units. Um, and it talks about uh, two and a half uh, uh, per 100, uh, per 375 cubic, meter, uh, cubic uh, uh, meters, uh, meters uh, sorry, square meters. Um, uh, but that only addresses uh, retail outlets. Uh, it doesn't address, are you, are you going to restrict those four units to retail? Because if you're not, if someone's going to come along and, and do a personal uh, services uh, 
is, is in, in one or two of the areas, like a, a dog groomer, for instance. We've got one there already, uh, or a hairdresser, such and such. Um, that is a that's a different allocation and a different number of parking spaces. Um, so I just I just wonder whether you or, or you've discussed it with the planning uh, how you're going to get around this. Um, and the other thing, right? Um, so that that um, that lay by that looks really nice, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure it'll get used. Um, is uh, are you paying for this, or is the city? Because that city property that, that you you moved around a bit to create that parking lot. Are you comfortable asking this Parking or Brian? <laughs> So I think the nature of the question was, we have, if you actually look at our table, we have, I think, just the amount of parking that's required by the bylaw when you look at all the components. That doesn't include the street front parking. We can't claim that. We don't own that. It's just meant to sort of contribute to the street and the convenience of the retail. Um, but I think the nature of the question is, the, the basis of the zoning requirement for, for commercial space, but if you did something different, like a restaurant or like a personal service use, it might trigger a different parking requirement and then would you be deficient? So it, it really depends. It depends on the size of, of said use that's replacing the commercial because at 150 uh, square meters or less, you don't require any parking spaces. So if they were cut into smaller units, then it wouldn't be an issue. Um, but I don't know, it's a good question, we haven't really looked at is there a potential for a use that could go in there with the spaces that are there that's non-commercial that would trigger a higher requirement and should we be tweaking the zoning to accommodate that potential use in the event that that happens. And that's something that is a good point and we'll go away and make sure of that because we don't want to hem ourselves into a corner where you might want to provide X use and you can't. I mean, at the end of the day, we want to look at the uses that we think make sense for that space. We don't want it to, to be unnecessarily sterilized or something that's not really um, going to be conducive to what we're looking for. So, the answer is right now it should be okay moving forward, depending on how it's structured. It could be a potential issue, but we'll look at it before we hammer the zoning into place to make sure that we can accommodate what would be appropriate for the context. Does that answer your question, sir? Well, you, you still have to address the shortage of parking spaces for the commercial units because you can't count the ones that are out on the street. So that's what I said at the very beginning, sir. So the ones on the street are not part of our calculation. That's right. So we meet the minimum requirements by the bylaw on site. There's parking in behind off of the lane that's in between the two buildings, and that's intended for the commercial as well, as well as the street parking. The street parking is not for this development, although at the beginning it'll likely be used mostly for it. Longer term, it's for the street. Yeah, and who's paying for the lay-by? Oh, yeah. oh, yes, there was that question. So I, my understanding is that um, Huntington's intending to do the lay-by as part of their developments. So they're effectively advancing the street project before its time um, with without you know any opportunity for compensation for that because they recognize it's going to help their development. That made me think of two things. Um, one is that in the community design plan, if you have a chance to read it, it's on ottawa.ca. If you search for Stittsville Main Street Community Design Plan, as part of that design plan, there's a, a whole plan for the street from the library up to Hazeldean Road. Uh, but as it stands now, the street would only get approved in terms of turning lanes or wider sidewalks or whatever it might be as each of the adjacent blocks are developed. And one of the things that I'm concerned about is this design plan is a 20 to, is it 20 to 30 year horizon mark or 20 year horizon? 40 years. It's a long term horizon. And I, I kind of shudder to think about the impact that has to everyone, whether you're driving a car, whether you're walking, to have a continual uh, spread of, of construction. It's something that I've raised with uh, some of the management at City Hall too. Can we look at, it won't be in the next five years, can, but can we look at a longer term budget to just do the street properly? Because that's another way that you can attract some healthier development. Uh, the other thing on parking is, it sort of came up before in a way with the pedestrian crosswalk. If we can get one in this area, it's a really nice connection to the municipal parking lot. A lot of people don't even know we have a municipal parking lot here. We do, it's almost exactly across the street from this property. 
and it's hardly ever used. It's one of our best kept parking secrets in Spitzville. And one of the reasons it's, it's not is because unless you're on that side of the road, it's a real pain as a pedestrian to get over. Uh, I know there's people, for example, who have kids attending the uh, music school that's currently on this site. And uh, you know they could park in that lot, but to run across Spitzville, Maine is not exactly a safe thing to do with kids. So that's another benefit is why I think a lot of us are interested in exploring that pedestrian crosswalk link across there. But I saw a question. There's someone in the back corner here earlier. Todd, did you have a question earlier? You're good? Okay. Yes. The same about the parking. Parallel parking, city, city is, uh, Main Street is narrow. It's not the next few years will be widened. How people, how this affect the traffic when cars try to park there? Right now it's very busy and they, every time somebody want to come in or out, will stop the traffic. Uh, wouldn't be easier to put angled parking? That is one question and also previously were people talking about coming out of Oriville. We could turn right with difficulty, but turning left that I need to do. I go pretty street, go to, through pretty street, go to the lights and make that to and come back and then turn. It is, you know, it's not easy how this will be addressed. We probably won't have a stoplight, but at least uh, or way stop or something or whatever to because it is two end of the Oriville station are two building that the rental that is quite they quite large then our development 21 and plus other houses and more coming and you know that lead corner it is impossible like some lady mentioned it's possible to come in come out of the street I can see Stream making notes here that I'm, sh I'm sure you're passing on to the traffic planner, but uh, does anyone want to? Okay, yes. Brian, okay. So there was a few things there. The first, I think, was how are you going to fit the parking on, on the street within the existing right of way? So what we explained at the beginning is this development is actually going to have to set back far enough so that it can give some width to the city across its front. So effectively, that parking that you're seeing across the front of the site is going to be in widened citywide right-of-way land. So it's not taking up existing asphalt, if you will, in the, in the street. It's happening outside of that. Yes, but I understand, I understand your concern. I'm, I'm getting to it. So the concern, I think, next is, okay, so if I'm driving along Stiftsville Main Street right now, it's already busy, and now all of a sudden there's going to be cars parking there and slowing me down. Well, I think... The, the challenge here, and, and not everybody's going to love this answer, but the challenge here is if you're going to truly create a traditional Main Street on Spitzville Main Street, it's going to take on that type of reality for people. So I live in the Glebe. My parents and my in-laws are in Spitzville, actually. So I, I love Spitzville. I love Spitzville Main Street. I'm excited about this project. But you know, my reality of driving in the Glebe is such that I know I'm not getting anywhere quickly on that street. I know pedestrians are enjoying it first and foremost. And the reason they're enjoying it first and foremost is because everything is happening slowly. And that's the environment that the city's trying to, to create in balance, is what I'll say. So you don't want to get it so it's so gridlocked that nobody can get home or out of their houses, but there's a balance. And I think the reality, which gets to your other comment about, well, I'm going to drive all the way around to make a left, that's another reality of, of living and driving next to Main Street. Now, the transportation study will look at it, and the city may come back and say, you have to do something about this problem. But my gut will tell me that they probably won't advocate for anything, because for the same reasons I'm mentioning to you, it's just the nature of a traditional Main Street. And unfortunately, that's the price. But the reward, hopefully, is that all of a sudden you have a vibrant Main Street that over time people are going to want to experience on a different level, on weekends, on evenings, and so on. And that's the tension in planning. Um, we have Mark here. There's a question from the audience that I think you'd be probably best to address. The question is, can 
This development reflects the historical aspect uh, in the facade facing Main Street. Um, but if I could ask it maybe a different way, because we've had a lot of comments asking, well, I thought the community design plan said that the new, the new developments needed to look more historic. And uh, I wonder if you could just give some comments on what the community design plan does or doesn't do. And a second question is I know another step as part of this development process is Huntington needs to take this design, this proposal, through the Urban Design Review Panel. And I was wondering if you could just quickly talk about what that process looks like. Well, it's an excellent question, and it's something that um, we have to review. And just a little bit about myself and my role in the city. Um, I'm Mark Young. I worked hand-in-hand uh, -hand with the community and the previous councilor on the community design plan. There's lots of people, some familiar faces here, which is great. Um, we also did a secondary plan. So the secondary plan sets out requirements. Um, the CDP sets out guidelines and policies on a whole scope of things. So Ryan sort of addressed how they were addressing some of the guidelines and policies. But one of the guidelines and policies does relate to um, consideration of historic details in terms of building design. Um, so, you know, there is an encouragement of looking at things such as materials, um, scale, um, articulation of buildings to uh, reflect and to try to um, enhance the existing character of the area. It's challenging because this is a four-story building, as Ryan said, it's the first one. And so, you know, we have to deal with existing context and future context. So I'm not sure if I'm, I'm answering the question. I hope I'm answering the question. Um, but uh, we, we look at a variety of factors. And in the CDP, we look at those guidelines and try to achieve as much as we can. And the Urban Design Review Panel? So the Urban Design Review Panel is a panel of um, architects, landscape architects, and there is a heritage expert on the panel. Um, they are an independent body, and they review projects within design priority areas throughout the city. So Stillman Main Street is considered a design priority area, and so this project is subject to their review. They will be reviewing the project in April um, for a second time. They reviewed it at a pre-consultation level previously, and that uh, consultation and that session is open to the public. So we'll, we'll get that information out there in terms of when that session is. It's the beginning of April. Um, and they will be looking at elements such as articulation of the building, materiality, and how it addresses the existing context. So one of their big, I mean, there is a heritage expert on the panel from Perth, and he really does, um, he will be looking at the existing context and trying to provide feedback on how this project can integrate within the existing context. Can I add to that? Sure. Mm -hmm. So I, I just think it's relevant to add that. Um, so we've gone through our informal hearing at the UDRP. Um, so they had a chance to review the project that was very similar to what we're showing today, with the exception of a few of the articulations that we're showing in the front elevation. Um, we were certainly mindful of, of the opinion that we were going to be getting from the community with respect to traditional elements, to heritage design elements. So we asked them specifically to comment on the design of the building as it relates to heritage and as it relates to traditional details, and asked them if the amount of traditional detailing on the building needed to be enhanced in some way, if the building was too modern for the guidelines or the requirements of CDP, and they unanimously said that the way, the articulation of the building as it was, was certainly in keeping with their expectation for the street. Uh, I just had a quick question about the parking area on the front. You did mention that it's going to be part of the street eventually. There's not another loading area. How is the commercial, um, how are the commercial units on the front going to be serviced once that becomes part of the street and that parking slash loading area is no longer available? Okay. So all of these commercial units at Graves and even the unit count for the building in general would not be considerably large in terms of city requirements. There's no requirement for any loading zone or loading space uh, with the size of these units. We would imagine that um, Loading would either happen, you know, could potentially happen on Orville, or it could even happen uh, in the driveway at off-peak hours where they access the, the rear entrance to the building. But as it stands right now, with the size units, we don't, we don't foresee loading being a, being a significant issue. 
Yeah, we probably have time for one or two more questions because uh, I want to make sure we have a little bit of time to uh, look around the room. Go right in the middle here. My question is just regarding the kind of programming that's happening in terms of the commercial or the retail section. So a key part in terms of making this a success in terms of a more walkable or is the type of tenants that you plan on placing into that commercial retail section. Do you have any idea of what type of tenants you bring in there? Yeah, it's a um, question we have regularly. It's, um, uh, we haven't, uh, we don't have any agreements or any signed agreements. Uh, we have a couple of tenants in our existing buildings that have expressed interest. Uh, they're fairly low impact. Um, you know, the, in the renderings, um, you know, cafe is all over the front, and you know, I, I can't see a, a, a coffee shop coming in and competing with quitters, but um, you, know, you never know. I mean, sometimes Starbucks will put uh, two restaurants across the street from each other. Um, so we, we don't really know. It's it's going to have to be a mix. We're, as we get into the design and the, um, uh, and the um, through the approval process, you know, we're, we're going to start to advertise. We're going to advertise and uh, promote the, uh, the residential co concurrent with promoting the commercial. So you know, there was a comment about the parking. Um, you know, if it's a you know, if an office comes to us and says, I, you know, I, I want uh, six parking spots, that could be done. Um, if it's a restaurant, um, you know, it's, it's probably going to have to be a low impact restaurant, but um, you know, it's, it's really, it's really a, it's maybe a non-answer, but uh, um, it's, it's we're just going to have to figure that out relative to zoning, parking, uh, compatibility. We don't want something that's going to be disturbing the residential above, you know, no nightclubs in all likelihood. So, um, you know, again, it's kind of a non-answer, but I think it's the best we can do right now is that it's, it's got to be compatible, it's, it's got to be profitable, uh, but it's got to be, um, uh, you know, fit in and uh, work in the building. So, I mean, the, the, in, the back wall of the, the retail is, is going to be it's not going to be connected, but uh, there's going to be a residential hallway back there. So all these things are going to have to be considered, and you know we want the building, the, the retail, to fit in with the residential, uh, the parking, and the street to the neighbors. So uh, that's kind of the best I can do right now. I have no advice. Try. No, getting getting the right retail mix is important, obviously. The city can't control that, and it really is up to the landowner, but it's an excellent point. And something that I know uh, you heard from business owners as well, important to get the right mix. And no nightclubs, thank you. Uh, last question. Go to... So when I go back to the um, CDP, they talked about buildings with the minimum of two stories here, but if they were three or four, the second and third, or sorry, the third and fourth floors would be set back uh, two meters from the facade of the, of the floor two. Uh, this seems to be a variance to that. And, uh, and the point of it was that it was to uh, reduce the impression of height from a pedestrian and viewpoint on Main Street and sort of tie in more with the lower one and two story buildings that are, exist on Main Street. Um, this is an anomaly to that. Is that a, a, a bylaw change? Want to comment on that, uh, Ryan or Brian? So I am actually looking through my uh, information on whether that happened. It's supposed to happen at the second or third story, but um, my recollection it was that it was supposed to happen after the third story at the fourth, which is what is proposed. But I'll keep looking through my document stream. You, am I wrong about that? Maybe Mark. 
Oh yeah, Mark, Mark seems to know the plan inside of it. So that was uh, predicated on the, the setback of the street. So in this instance, the building, because of the road bike, is actually, I believe, they're uh, over a meter back from the new property line, in addition to the, I believe, four meters of road bike. So the intent was that if the building was right at the property edge, right at the street, um, yes, that we were concerned with the overlook and we needed to push back. But if the building could potentially go straight up if it was at that three meter setback. So in this case, I you know, don't have the exact numbers off, off hand, and I know they are setting back the fourth floor. Fourth floor. Yeah, I noticed that by a meter and a half, but uh, it's it's something for, uh, for us to consider. So thank you for Okay, we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, if you have additional questions, you can email me. I wanted to mention a couple things. First of all, the deadline for formal public comments is March 14th. And if you want to make a formal com a comment, the easiest way is to email Spreen, spreen.shen at ottawa.ca. That information is on my website. It's also on the city website. Uh, you can also call him. You can email him. You can fax him if you make your comments, <laughs> if you're so inclined. Uh, by submitting formal comments, that becomes part of the public record. So it's an important thing to do if you have specific questions or concerns or feedback about it. Uh, and it's something that Stream takes and his colleagues in planning will take, and they will look at the comments, apply them against what's being proposed, and if there's issues that need to resolve, uh, they'll work to resolve those. Is that the right way to put it? Yeah. Uh, you can continue to share your comments with me as well. There are two sign-up sheets outside. Many of you I know signed up. One is a, a sign-up for Stream, which would give you updates to uh, any official updates to the planning process. So uh, if there's any formal steps that are forthcoming, you'll be given an alert on that. There's also a sign-up for my email newsletter. Uh, so it comes out about once a week, and I share updates about meetings like this and other events and activities in the community. Uh, but I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight, for spending uh, two hours with us. Um, there's still some coffee and cookies left if you want to grab one for the road. Thank you to Alan and his team from Huntington and from Foten. I want to thank Stream and Mark from the city for joining us. And also to my team, to Emily and Chelsea and Bethanique. Uh, they've had a very long day today between City Hall. We had a uh, eight hour, nine hour council meeting, and then a seven hour council meeting. It was long. Uh, and then back here to, to uh, Carvel Rec, Hooper. So thank you to everyone for your help tonight. Thanks for being here tonight. And uh, have a great evening. Thank you.